Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Garden Learn and Grow series, a la virtual Zoom meeting. I want to let everyone know that we are recording and a, um, a replay link will go out to you within 48 hours. If all goes well, we will post it on YouTube publicly. If it's not, not so happy, we might just make it somewhat semi-private. Uh, all registrants, if you are not muted, please mute yourself. We'll use the chat box for questions and we'll answer those at the end. And uh, bear with us because we're all volunteers. I know that we have a few new people who have, don't, may or may not know much about the Botanical Garden. So this is a little bit of an intro. Uh, the most important thing to know is that we are free and open every day of the year from 7 a.m. until dusk. The Williamsburg Botanical Garden is quite small. It's only two acres in what is actually a traffic circle in the road on the way to the Freedom Park parking lot. But there's a lot packed into those two acres with 18 different types of habitat, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, an English perennial garden, three types of wetlands, a succulents rock garden, a fairy garden, and a newly renovated native grasses garden, to name only a few. Our garden is purposefully more natural than what you might expect when you hear the words botanical garden. And I was doing air quotes there. It is most definitely not a manicured display of high maintenance plantings. I usually describe it as a wild child and it has a strong emphasis on native plants that support pollinators and it is the site of registered monarch butterfly way station number 3394. The garden's mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening practices and to offer education on related topics. Everything in the garden is tended by dedicated volunteers and we do it on a slim budget indeed. So here comes the pitch. The garden is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation and receives no funding from any government agency. Our website is, strangely enough, WilliamsburgBotanicalGarden.org. A lot to type, but once your browser knows that you want to go there, it'll fill it in for you. Our Learn and Grow programs are free and under normal circumstances, we would have a donations jar at the registration table. And over the years, this has been a steady source of revenue for the garden. Now that we're virtual, the follow-up email will of course include a link to our virtual donations jar. If you'd like to support the garden further, we encourage you to consider a garden membership. Many of us are doing way more shopping online these days, and a portion of your Amazon purchases can actually support the, the garden or any other nonprofit of your choice when you start at smile.amazon.com. And when you order bulbs in, from Brent and Becky's in Gloucester, they donate a very generous 25% of the order total to the nonprofits enrolled in their program. You simply select which one you want to support, but you have to start at bloomandbucks.com. You'll also find the garden on Facebook and YouTube. This is where we'll be posting the recording. On Facebook, we also have a milkweed connection group for those of us who raise monarch butterflies. And we're, we're down to the nubbins on milkweed, but we also are down to uh, the last few caterpillars. Um, I have two chrysalises left that look like they're gonna emerge today. Okay, learn and grow programming is going to continue to be virtual until further notice. Um, in November, Brian Tabor from the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory will explain to us how everything is connected. We take December off for the holidays and in January, we're going to have a pruning workshop of some sort. 
please watch your inbox for our email with details. Last item before I introduce our speakers, master gardeners and nat master naturalists can claim this in the BMS reporting system as continuing education. So let's get started. All three of today's speakers are members of the Historic Rivers Chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalists. And you'll find more information about them on historicrivers.org and on their Facebook page. Now to start with, Wendy Nelson is a freelance photographer with a great sense of humor, as you can see. She specializes in wildlife photography and is the photographer for the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center. In addition to being interested in photographing aquatic things, she finds bats fascinating. Bill Harper is a retired nurse anesthetist. After 41 years spent in white tiled operating rooms, he went back to his love of the outdoors. And in 2016, both he and his wife became master naturalists. Didn't know much about bats prior to volunteering as a leader for the Yorktown Mobile Bat Monitoring Route. Over the past five years, he has enjoyed expanding his knowledge of bat species and their role as both pollinators and in controlling insects. Joni Carlson has a background in food and nuclear analytical chemistry, which sounds really, really heavy, and currently works in the anthropology department at William & Mary as administrative coordinator, which also sounds very heavy duty. She is passionate about drawing, raising and releasing butterflies, especially monarchs. She and her husband, Mike, are the Virginia Bluebird Coordinators for Surrey County, and they consider bat monitoring evenings as date nights. So welcome, and thank you to the Bat Squad. Wendy, I'm going to end my screen sharing and let you take it away. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get this set up here, so bear with me for just one second while we get to where we need to be. Oops. Okay, and I'm getting my first glitches out of the way, as you can see. Okay, are you seeing a slide that says good evening? Yes, we are. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, because it was, you realize that it is morning, but I was going to say good evening, which was my kind of first and last joke, my really poor imitation of a vampire. All right, but anyway, my name is Wendy Nelson, and the first thing that you need to know is I am not a bat expert. Um, I am a Virginia Master Naturalist, and I'm one of the two co-founders of the Bat Squad, which we started just... Um, a little over um, a couple years ago now. Now, I wanted to start out, and this is a lot easier <clears throat> when I have a group in front of me and I can see raising hands. So I'm going to count on Judith here to look um, to see what your responses are. So if you know how to use your yes and no buttons or you're raising hands, I want to know how many of you know why bats hang upside down. So are we seeing any responses, Judith? Um, I'm not saying, I responded that I do not. <laughs> okay. Um, people and, and, may, not, may not be seeing that. Sure. I'm gonna go on the assumption that most people don't know why bats hang upside down because as I started learning about bats, I realized I had no clue. And why don't they fall off when they go to sleep? And I brought these questions up to show that there's just so much that we don't know about bats, which really surprised me. The whole bat squad started at Williamsburg because we found out that Richmond, um, Virginia Master Naturalist chapter, were starting to um, survey the bats that are in their area. And we thought, oh, that's really cool. We want to do that. And so, um, <clears throat> 
one of my fellow master naturalists, Brenda, her name is Brenda and I um, started looking into what kind of equipment we needed, what we wanted, what we could do to actually start working with bats. And so when we started looking, we found out that there's really little known about bats, which surprised us because it seems like we know about everything in this day and age of the internet. And so why don't we? I was talking to, at that point in time, um, Bo Baker at the Virginia Living Museum, and he had a couple of different theories. And his theories were, first of all, research is done on animals that we use, like deer for its meat. There's tons and tons of information on white-tailed deers. And um, then, is it rare? Well, yeah, we've got some bats that are endangered, but bats that really particularly aren't very rare. The cute factor. Uh, really, bats, you know, really aren't that cute until you get to know them. Then you find them very cute. So they don't fit the categories. And they also have the creepy factor. And he also figured that researchers really don't like going out at night. So here are the bats that are found in Virginia. And if you take a look at it, yeah, it's kind of a stretch to say that they're cute. So bats, sorry, I'm gonna go back for a second. There we go. Bats are facing some significant threats. White nose syndrome is really still going rampant across the United States and still some problems. We're losing a lot of bats due to white nose syndrome. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, wind turbines have been a problem. You may have heard that wind turbines are a problem with birds, but they're also a big problem with bats. Habitat loss, of course, is an issue with almost any animal at this point in time, climate change. But one of the things that's a big problem as well is fear. And we'll go into that in a bit. So why should we care? Well, first of all, bats are the primary consumer of night flying insects. They're worth more in some studies than $3.7 billion a year simply in pest control. Since we have bats and since they're controlling the bats, we are controlling the insects, we can use less pesticides, which obviously is a good thing for most of the animals and insects. Uh, we get more yield from our crops. Um, by the way, this is also when I'd say, all right, any of you like tequila? Um, you wouldn't have your margaritas if it weren't for bats. Bats are one of the main pollinators of the agave plant. They are also being used for research, for medical um, research and for defense, like sonar came for the idea came from bats. So why are we here? The things that I want to be able to share with you is I want to give you some basic bat education. I want to help convince you that bats can be ext are extremely helpful. And one of my main things is I want to show you how fascinating bats can be. I was really surprised. I always thought bats were fascinating to begin with. But um, just the more you dig into them, you'll really figure out how incredible these animals are. We're gonna tell you what we're doing to help and we're gonna tell you what you can also do. Okay, first thing is bats are mammals. All right, a little bit about them. Bats give live birth. The babies will fly with their mom until they're a little bit fly attached to their mom um, until they're a little bit too heavy for the mom to carry. And then they are in nursery colonies when they're too big to fly with mom. Most of the bats in the United States, well, this is really kind of interesting. They're, they mate during the fall, and yet the fertilization is dormant until the spring temperature rises and then activates it. And then they're basically the pregnancy starts, which is pretty darn cool. Now, one thing you have to be careful about is when you start searching, it's like anything else. If you start searching for information about bats, one of the things that comes up is they can eat up to 1200 mosquitoes per hour and I saw this over and over and over when I started um, searching bats and it's like something seemed off on that. You've got to realize that that information was gathered because they took a room full of mosquitoes and some bats. They found out how many 
<clears throat> mosquitoes a bat will eat in a minute or two, and then they extrapolated that to 1,200 mosquitoes per hour. Well, the problem is, is first of all, the only thing that was in that room was mosquitoes and a bat. The thing of it is, is that bats cannot fly all night long. They don't have the energy for that. They're not like birds that will glide. They're constantly flapping their wings. So they need to be able to eat quick and then rest. And so the thing is, is that with mosquitoes, when it comes down to it, it's like you saying, I'm really, really hungry. I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. Are you going to go to popcorn? Or are you going to want a cheeseburger or better yet, a, a steak? <clears throat> So that yes, bats will, if they're desperate, they'll eat mosquitoes, but mostly they're going to be going after the moss and the beetles, something that will give them a lot more nutrients in a quick bite than a mosquito will. <clears throat> they do, however, <clears throat> excuse me, eat mosquitoes, so that is good. Now, um, I have body as a mitt down here. I'm going to show you that in a little bit, um, but let's talk about flight for a second. As I mentioned, um, bats will flap. They don't glide. <clears throat> they don't have feathers. They are mammals. And one of the fascinating things um, <clears throat> is that Ch Chiroptera is, um, is their Latin name. And what it basically means is hand wing. If you actually look at the wing of a bat, they have bones that have basically, just like your hand, has a thumb, and it has four fingers that are really, really, really long, and then the flaps of skin are between these fingers. Um, now, one thing, they have very erratic flight patterns when they're feeding because they can turn on dime. It's really quite fascinating. They're nocturnal, and they're very rarely encountered during the day. Now, one thing that I want to show you, and hopefully this works, um, is I wanted to give you, I'm going to pull up this video, and this video will show you the relationship between bats and moths, how the bats will hunt. Um, also, watch as we're going through this video, um, the bats can use their wings as like a catcher's mitt. So watch as the bat gets closer to the moth, he will scoop out his wing and use his wing to help catch. So I'm um, going to count on Judith to let me know if they're actually working. And see. Flying was a ticket to the vast larder of moths that filled the night skies. Yeah, we're, but how could we're they find hunting. small, fast-moving prey without sunlight? Bats use their ears. They emit high-intensity pulses of sound. Then listen for echoes bouncing back. Their brains process these reflections into a three-dimensional image, an accurate picture of their dark world. Slowing down picture and sound gives a clearer view of each encounter. This sonar is a brilliant weapon for finding prey in the dark, making bats successful around the world. Bats, though, didn't have it all their own way for long. Moths evolved a counter weapon, a simple ear that could detect approaching sonar. An early warning allows the moth to swerve away. As bats approach, they increase their calling rate. For moths, an emergency cue to plummet. Though not always to safety. Okay, so a couple of things to actually pull from that video is that um, the bats, as they get closer to the prey, so they mentioned that they use the sonar and that the clicks that the bats are making, um, which by the way were slowed down so that we could actually hear it in an audible range, um, you will not be able to hear the bat calls. The bat calls are ultrasonic. 
And so they slowed down that video so we could actually hear the chirping of the bat. But notice as that got closer to the moth, the, um, it would increase the rate of their chirps to actually pinpoint where the moth was. The other thing that was fascinating is something that they had just realized they were talking about that um, the moths themselves can't hear that ultrasonic pulse that the bats are putting out, but they have developed a more type of an inner ear that can feel the pulse, notice the pulse, and um, it basically just drops the moth out of the sky. The thing is, is, is the moth isn't reacting to it, it actually has its body react to it itself. And what it does is it basically kind of just drops one wing. One wing isn't usable. And that's why the moths just start spiraling down out of the sky. And so it's an interesting evolutionary thing that happened with the moths. After a while, they realized they needed something, you know, that something that was helping them survive. Okay, every once in a while in here, I have just a fun little distraction. Um, that I found that I came that I wanted to show along. One says that can bats swim? It's not something that they really would like to do. It's not something that they really ever go out and purposely do, but it is something that <laughs> So I kind of think of it as like a dog doing a dog paddle. All right, so let's talk about their echolocation a little bit. The interesting thing is, is when they're sending these pulses out, they can actually tell the size of it by the intensity of the echo. They can tell the direction based on the pitch of the echo. They actually have good vision. So when they're saying blind is a bat, that isn't the case. Bats actually have pretty good vision. They actually use both. Now, um, there's one thing that I've got a link down in here, but we've got too much to cover today, so I'm not going to um, run this. But you might want to look up Ben, ben Underwood. Um, ben Underwood is um, a blind at this point in time, when I created this, a blind teenager that has figured out how to use echolocation. So he'll go around the neighborhood um, doing clicks, just making clicks with his mouth, and he is able to hear the, um, just like the echolocation, he can, he can hear the bounce back of that sound and he can tell when things are in front of him. He actually will go, he plays basketball, he um, can ride a bike, he can do all of these things. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating video. Um, I believe this was from 60 Minutes um, where it shows that he's walking down the street, he's making the clicks and he can tell that there's a car there. He can tell that there is um, a trash container there. Um, so very, very fascinating thing. And I've seen this a couple of different places that people who are blind are trying to work on their echolocation skills. Okay. I'll talk about shelter a little bit. Bats can squeeze into holes basically as small as three eighths of an inch. They're attracted to spaces inside buildings and attics under bridges, culverts, um, siding on buildings, palm trees, um, under the eaves, porch or patio awnings. Um, I spoke to somebody who worked at Colonial Williamsburg and they said a number of the old houses um, actually will have bats that are living there. Um, the old houses are more likely to have the bats. The new houses are built a little bit tighter and hard for the, harder for them to find places to go into. Um, shelter a lot of times will include rough surfaces for hanging. Um, and I just realized in talking about that, we didn't talk about why they hang upside down. All right, well, bats are mammals. And the thing of it is, is that they're built differently than birds. Birds can take off from the ground. Bats can take off from the ground, but it's extremely difficult. And so when you think about it, the reason that they hang upside down, you're up in a cave, you're up in a tree, you hang upside down. When they just let go of the branch or whatever they're hanging on to, they're starting their dive. All they have to do is open their wings, and that's how they take off. So I think of it as like a hang glider. You're not going to really be able to get a hang glider off the ground that easily. Most of the time, people will go to a hill or they'll go to a cliff edge and they just kind of fall off of it and that's how bats are doing it and that's why they hang upside down. So the other question was, 
why don't bats fall off when they're hanging upside down and they're sleeping? Um, well, bats have um, developed so that when they're actually grabbing onto a branch, this is hard to do over Zoom, when they're hanging onto a branch, it's basically the weight of the bat causes their foot to contract and to hold on. So it's the weight of themselves that's contracting their foot and holding on to the branch. And so they actually have to actually physically, mentally let go of the branch to take off. Um, so that's why they don't fall off when they're falling asleep. Okay, I wanted to talk about some of the myths around bats. One of the problems that I mentioned with bats is fear. Um, there have been, it, people have been known to, come to burn inside of caves to kill off the bats inside of caves. Um, I was just listening to ologies. If you have, if you have never heard of the um, podcast ologies, it's a really fascinating po podcast. And I hadn't thought about it until now, looking for one if they had one on bats. They do. And I started listening to it on the way down to, to work this morning, and it was marvelous. Um, but anyway, the person who was um, interviewed on that ology podcast was one of the premier experts. He's been working with bats for, um, I think, about five decades. And he was talking about the Austin area. And if you're not familiar with the Austin area, there is a bridge there where there are millions of bats that will go to roost at night. And you can stand there and you can watch it. And it's supposed to be just absolutely fascinating. Well, it turns out that a couple of decades ago when the bats started using this place, um, the city didn't want it. They wanted to go through and try to figure out how in the world they could stop the bats from coming there. Um, and this man was, um, the reason basically that Austin has let the bats be there. Um, and so fear is a big thing. And why people are afraid? Well, first of all, you'll hear uh, my grandma would say, my bat, the bats get in my hair. Um, that's really not the case. You might have bats flying around you. Well, because especially if you're using a lot of hairspray or something, it's the bugs that are around you and the bats are gonna go to the, where the bugs are. And so bats do not, get in people's hair. Bats have rabies. Now this is true. Bats can carry rabies. Um, but if you take a look at the numbers, it's basically there's like 1.5 per people a year that will get rabies from a bat. Think about that. 1.5 people a year. You have a better chance of getting killed by a falling vending machine than from getting rabies from a bat. So fewer than 1% of bats will actually have rabies. Um, and it's different than foxes or coons. You know, a lot of times if a, a dog gets rabid or a fox or a coon, um, they will actually get um, more dangerous. They might actually go after you. They get afraid, they get scared, they get paranoid, and they might try to attack. But it's different in bats. If a bat has rabies, it just becomes paralyzed and then it can't fly and it can't roost. So basically, if you see a bat on the ground, just stay away from it. Um, call animal control. Let somebody who is knowledgeable take care of that. And last one, back slut plug. Yes, that is true, uh, but only basically three of the roughly 1,200, and at this point in time, it's up to 1,400 existing species of bats are vampire bats, and none of those live in the United States or in Canada. Bats are pests. Now, bats can be pests. You really don't particularly want a bat in your attic, but the best thing to do about it at that point in time is to just safely try and get that bat out of your attic. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Okay, distraction time. Now remember when I said bats aren't really particularly cute, I want to introduce you to Miss Alicia. Miss Alicia. So this is last night's rescue. This is Miss Alicia, who, oh, well that's made her. Bit happier than she was before. Um, so, <clears throat> very nice human Alicia. Um, rang her in last night after she'd um, about here, Alicia would run into a car. But fortunately, there's nothing broken. All four limbs are working very well. She's nice and bright and alert. She's 
completely enjoying her banana. Look at those cheeks. My goodness. Chipmunk cheeks. Okay, so hopefully for some of you who don't think bats are very cute, maybe at least found Alicia cute. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about white nose syndrome um, because that's something that is because that has been a problem now for a number of years um, and is a big concern for the survival of bats. Um, think of white nose syndrome as a parasite feeding off the bat. What happens is the bats have fat stores that are being used to feed themselves as they hibernate and winter over. But the problem is, is that the, it's also then feeding this white nose syndrome, this fungus. And um, so the bats usually have just enough fat to make it through the winter. But now when it's actually feeding another thing, the gas tank is empty sooner. And what happens is it's not the white nose syndrome fungus itself that's killing the bat. It's the fact that they're waking up too early. They don't have enough fat stores. They wake up early. They come out of hibernation at a time up to two months early where there just isn't any food around. There's no insects around at that point in time. It's a recent thing. So basically, biologists first saw bats sick and dying from white nose syndrome in the cave in Albany, New York in 2007. Although previous to that, some people have said that, wait, no, they were seeing this earlier, as early as 2006. White nose syndrome has killed millions of bats in North America. In some sites, and this is the big thing, it has a 90 to 100% fatality in the bat hiberniculum. So for instance, when I started, first started studying the bats for the master naturalists, um, I thought there must be caves around here someplace where I can go see bats. And so I was looking into caves that were up in Pennsylvania that were um, reported to have hundreds of thousands um, to close to a million bats that were at this one old abandoned church. And I thought, oh, wonderful. And so I did a search and it turned out that they went from probably about 500,000 to about 32 bats from that hiberniculum. So the white nose can really wipe out um, a bat population. So estimated six plus million bats have died and actually I have not given this presentation for the last two years. So I'm sure it's significantly more than that. Um, so far, 15 species in North America are affected by it. Um, the thing of it is, is there are bats that will roost in, um, will hibernate in caves and roost in caves. There are bats that are actually will do that in trees. Um, so of course, it's more the caves that are the problem because they're all really closely together. Social distancing for bats doesn't happen in caves. Um, so the little brown bat population was decimated by about 90%, while tricolor and northern long-eared bats are suffering losses of around 97%. Here is the map that showed um, white nose syndrome when I created this um, two years ago. And um, so if you look down in Texas, there's some in the northern part of Texas, <clears throat> a little bit farther down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look up in Washington. There's some up in Washington. I went and pulled the map today and look what's happened down in the southern part of Texas, down in Austin, where I was talking about all of the bats that were down there. It is still spreading throughout um, the United States. And so it's definitely a problem. There is hope. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go through this slide, but I'm going to say it does show that um, some of the hiberniculums are being able to be uh, are to come back from this, um, but it still is a really, really big problem. <laughs> we need to take it seriously. You can't dismiss the fact that bats are still dying, the disease is spreading, and several spe species are potentially facing extinction. <clears throat> so biggest thing that I wanted to show you is what you can do to help fight white nose syndrome. You'll find out that really there's not all that much that we can do to help bats. There's a little bit. Um, one of the things, especially with fighting help, um, <clears throat> help fighting white nose syndrome, and this is, is, is <clears throat> the cave sites. Stay out of the sites where bats are hibernating. Um, 
make sure if you're caving and if you don't know if bats are there or not, make sure you decontaminate your caving gear and your clothes after you're visiting any cave sites, even if you don't see any bats. People can move the fungus on their clothing and their gear and it will spread the fungus. Um, they also recommend that you stop going into caves as early as November 15th because you don't want to be in there when the bats are hibernating. Don't go back until after they've actually left the caves. Um, so you can donate to uh, White Nose Syndrome's research fund. Um, basically, if it's a White Nose Syndrome area, um, it says never take ca caving gear into the White Nose Syndrome area. Basically, the best thing that you can do is just kind of avoid that area. Find someplace else to go caving that isn't as much of a problem. And again, if you find a sick or an injured bat, um, or you need a bat removed, contact your local wildlife agency. Don't touch the wild bats. <clears throat> All right, and so there's, you can search, just search for white nose um, syndrome and caving, and you can get more information if that's something that you should be interested in. So how much should you worry about bats and safety? Can bats be near me in a house, on a porch, or in a yard? Basically, a bat inside a building probably just is lost. The best thing to do is um, to just open the windows, turn after dark, open the windows to let the bats fly out on its own, turn off the lights outside to help the bats find the open, or inside to help the bats find the open windows and the doors. If it doesn't leave on its own, it talks about putting on leather gloves, placing a box over it. Best thing to do is call uh, your wildlife agency for them to help out. Um, and again, if you feel like you are going to do this and not calling your wildlife agency, hold the bat up high. Because when you're letting it go, remember, it doesn't know how to take off from the ground. So hold it up as high as you can to let it go to try and um, help it to fly away. Never ever handle bats with your, ba with your bare hands. Bats on buildings during the day, that's fine. I mean, because they might temporarily roost there as they're moving through the area. And so a lot of times they just be only around for a few days or up to a week or so, it's best to leave them alone. Um, in listening to the, the Ology bat program on the way down, uh, it was interesting because he said he's been around millions of bats through his lifetime, millions. He has never, ever had a bat try to attack him. He has been bitten a couple of times and it was simply because they were trying to survive and it was a survival instinct because he was holding them and they were trying to get away. But as bats were around him, never ever has he been attacked by a bat. So keep that in the back of your mind, even if you have a bat that's on your porch and it might be freaking you out a little bit, um, it's okay there. It's not hurting anything. It's not gonna hurt you. It's taking care of the, the um, the insects, so it's a good thing. Uh, by the way, bats are one of the primary, um, excuse me, bats are one of the primary um, controllers of like the corn ear or, uh, moth. And so it does a lot to protecting the crops. And so it's big for the farmers, not just um, for agave and, um, and fruit plants that, that are not in our area, um, just even things like corn crops. <clears throat> bats on the ground that act sick or unable to move may have rabies. So if it's on the ground, leave them alone. Make sure you keep the pets away from them and contact your local count at your health department immediately. <clears throat> okay, and we went through that if a bat has rabies, it's not going to be able to fly. It's just going to be lethargic. You might find it on the ground. The biggest thing is teach your children, love your own, leave other animals alone is a good principle for children to learn. Okay, so why are we talking to you about bats? We're talking because who's doing the bat. So when we started that, I thought, cool, let's do it. Who wants our data? I was sure that since not very much was known about bats, that there was gonna be multiple agencies that were looking around trying to get data from people. No. Anyone? Anyone? Really hard to find anybody that was looking for the bat data. <clears throat> All right, I just had something pop up on my screen that you probably saw saying 
my internet is on full, so there are no right away. So, we're okay, Wendy. Uh, this is Judith, and we've lost your audio. We're doing the acoustic monitoring, and acoustic monitoring, yeah, Wendy. Your audio is kind of breaking up a bit. Does anybody hear anything? Just you, Judith. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Wendy, we are not hearing you. I don't know if Wendy can hear me. Wendy, we do not hear you. I'm going to pause the recording. No, maybe not. I'll edit this out if necessary. Okay, let's see. It looks like Wendy may have ducked out. I'm going to pause the recording. No, this is fine. Okay. All right. So any bat is trying to get information about the bats and they want to figure out what's going on nationwide and so um, we decided okay that's great well, let's see how we can go from there so go ahead to the next slide and so i just wanted to give you some background as to what the historic rivers chapter of virginia master naturalist is doing we're doing acoustic monitoring. So we have a microphone that Bill will show you in a bit um, that will be able to take the ultrasonic sounds and then actually convert them using computer software into clicks that we can hear, audible clicks that we can hear and re record. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see with the data that we have, and this is data from 2018. We are doing what's called driving transects. You can go out and you can stand out into a field and you can hold up the microphone and you can find out what bats are there. But the problem is, is if you hear a bat and then two minutes later you hear another bat, you have no idea if that was the same bat or if it was a different bat. And so one way you control that is a little bit is to drive. And so we actually will take our microphone, put it on a stick, put it high above the car so it's not bouncing off the car and we drive along and we drive along at a rate that somebody first told me was faster than a bat can fly that is not the case it's more likely that if we're driving around at 20 miles an hour that the bat isn't really trying to keep up with us if we hear a bat and then a couple minutes later we hear another bat since we've been driving at between 15 and 20 miles an hour we it's more likely that that actually is a different bat so instead of standing out in a field where we can't get an idea of population, if we're driving, we can get an idea more of how many distinct bats we're seeing in the night. And so here is a count um, basically of the different areas. So we've got a transect we drive around um, down by Hog Island, one out in Lightfoot and Little Creek, New Kent. Um, and it will show you how many in 2018 on each night how many big brown bats we saw, how many evening bats, free tail bats, um, the red bats. Uh, red bats are most common in our area, by the way, at least in most of our areas. Silver haired, southeastern tricolors. One thing that you need to know is, is that it is a science, but it's uh, not exact science. At this point in time, when it's going through the bat calls, the software will look at different recorded bat calls, and it will compare those bat calls against other ones that they have in the database to make its best estimate, best guess, or not best guess, but best estimate of what kind of bat it is. It still can be wrong. And so what happens is, is that you, if you have a bat that um, you're coming up and it's like, oh, that bat's not supposed to be in our area, it doesn't necessarily mean that we saw that bat that wasn't supposed to be in our area. However, there's another way then to go in to look at the file and a bat expert can read through and look at that and may be able to determine where um, the computer wasn't able to determine what kind of bat it is. 
So if you go to the next slide, So of our different transects that we were keeping track of, um, we were just kind of curious who had on average the most bats. So Colonial Parkway is a wonderful place to see bats. Bats like ha to have a water source nearby. Uh, first of all, more insects are found near water sources, plus they themselves then also have a water source. Um, so Colonial Parkway is an excellent place to go and find bats. Um, Little Creek, Two Rivers, New Kent, these are all of our different transects. And if you go to the next slide, so this was just one of our transects. This was Lightfoot totals. And you'll see that the red bat is the most common bat that they saw there. Um, and you can take a e look at just the different numbers of bats on the different days. So we're hoping that as we go through time, since we started in 2018, um, and we've got 2019 data, this year we don't have data, but we're hoping to be able to look at our data year after year to find out um, whether our bat population is increasing, decreasing. We won't be able to get a true picture of it because again, it's on a specific night as we're driving, but we still, with time, should be able to see more what's going on. The more data you have, the more accurate predictions you can make from that. So here, if you go to the next slide, are just other transects that we've done, again, showing that um, the red bat is the most common bat in our area. And as far as other things, you'll find that the big brown bat, Yorktown, um, we had a bore of a tendency to big, see the big brown bat as their second most common. Whereas New Kent, um, that was down more tied with the evening bat and with the hoary bat. Okay, and so if you go to the next slide, what we hope to do, we hope to find and monitor roosting sites. Um, this is an area that we'd like to get into. So if you know of any old abandoned buildings that seem to have a bat roosting site, um, or just know of any bat roosting sites in the area, please contact the Historic Rivers Chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalist um, because what we'd like to do is we'd like to set up um, outside of the roosting site and watch the bats come out at night and see what bats um, we can figure out of what kind of bats they are and be able to track. Um, another thing that they'd like to track is um, for counting. Just stand out there with a counter and count the number of bats that come out of the roost. Um, we also hope to do more education like we're doing right now, this, this seminar. So if we go to the next slide. Oops, what sorry. Can you do? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so what can you do? There's really not a lot that you can do. You can put up bat houses and Bill will talk to you a little bit about the bat houses. Um, people have found that bat houses are really inconsistent and a lot of times bats don't find them or particularly like them. But it's okay to try because sometimes it will give them a nice roosting site. The biggest things that you can do to help is to do things that don't hurt them or don't hurt the things that they eat. Bugs are good. I had, uh, we've got a problem with ants in our house and an uh, um, exterminator came to our door and I said, we've got a problem with ants, what can you do? His answer was he was going to spray the whole yard. There's no reason to spray the whole yard just to keep control of ants in our house. Um, bugs are good. Um, when I was doing the training for Virginia Master Naturalist, one of the things that struck me the most was one of the tree experts came in and said, you want the bugs that eat the trees. You want the trees that the bugs will eat. The pears that you have in your yard, nobody's eating them. It's not supporting it. It's not supporting the bugs. It's not supporting the birds that eat the bugs or the bats or anything. So watch the pesticide use. Use as little as you possibly can. Have a natural backyard. Um, plant gardens that will have night blooming flowers that will attract the insects at night that will attract the bats. Um, have the trees and the shrubs for the bats to roost. Evergreens are important be, um, because of cover year round. Um, get away from the corporate yard, get biodiversity, um, just do all of the things that are going to help what the bats eat so they've got food and help 
tell people about the at bats, um, and that's my last slide, help people educate people about bats so that they're intrigued and they're interested and they're not afraid. So now that you've gotten a little bit of background on what Virginia Master Naturalists um, are doing with the acoustic monitoring, I was going to hand you over to Bill and he was going to talk about his monitoring in his area. Okay, um, are you ready for me kids? Yes, go ahead Bill. Okay, um, so what we did is this uh, goes back to the summer in August. Um, There's a uh, Boy Scout who's doing an Eagle project and he wanted to um, refurbish some of the existing uh, bat houses at Freedom Park and then add a third bat house. Um, so since I have the equipment to do bat monitoring, um, we decided that, well, maybe we should look at the uh, uh, health of the population at, uh, or the bat population at Freedom Park um, and uh, see maybe if some of these uh, bat houses that are located there need to be relocated and uh, where maybe the uh, best spot is to uh, put the third house. Um, I should point out that uh, there is a bat house at the Williamsburg Botanical Garden that was not part of the survey because it's uh, owned by Williamsburg Botanical Garden and we were just uh, looking at Freedom Park itself. Um, so what we did was uh, 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 went out and did some spot monitoring at Freedom Garden to see where the bats were and to see uh, again where maybe the best place is. Uh, and again, this is an informal recommendation, the best place to put some of the bat houses if they need to be left where they are or maybe move slightly. Um, so um, we went out and um, looked at uh, three or four sites and um, came up with uh, some recommendations um, for these bad houses. So if you wanna, you know, first thing I wanna do, I'm gonna deviate slightly because I wanna show you the equipment that we use to monitor the bats. So if you wanna go on speaker view, um, then I, you know, it's a bigger view of me and I can show you the, uh, uh, the equipment that we use, okay? So, uh, if you are not familiar with how to do that, there is in the upper right corner of your screen a little thing that says view. The options are speaker view, gallery view. Uh, so make sure you're clicked on speaker view and you'll see Bill holding up his cool toys. Okay, uh, so when we do the bat monitoring, uh, as Wendy mentioned that we use specialized equipment. Uh, we have a, a microphone here. Uh, this is a small but very expensive microphone that we attach to this high-tech piece of equipment, which is basically a, a long painting pole, okay? And what we do using the uh, painting pole and the microphone, this is attached to a very long USB cable that um, attaches to our laptop. Now we put this uh, through the sunroof of a car and get it up as high as possible, somewhere around six feet. We're kind of limited by the length of these USB cords. And then um, when we do uh, our mobile transect monitoring, like Wendy mentioned, we drive very slowly through a preset uh, uh, transect that uh, we go between 15 and 20 miles an hour. The monitoring at Freedom Park was a little different in that we did spot monitoring. And um, uh, so uh, we, we just looked at some areas uh, at Freedom Park. And um, I'm gonna share, uh, do a little screen sharing with you here. Let me see, let me do this here. So this, if you can see this, is 
the actual recording from that night of the bats, these are the echolocations that the various bats that we saw at Freedom Park put out from that night. And um, the way the bats are identified on this uh, recording, um, if you see uh, Labo, it's the, most bats have uh, a two word scientific name and what they do is uh, use the first two letters from each part of the name to identify the bat. So uh, what I'm, my cursor here is on, says Labo, and uh, that's the Eastern red bat, with, which is Lacerius borealis. So that's how we come up with Labo. So anyway, so you, you can see the, uh, uh, these are all the various echolocations of the different bats, and they do vary within the species depending on what they're flying or if they're getting close to um, uh, a prey or whatever. You also see indefinite recordings. These are thrown out because um, the uh, computer cannot recognize exactly what they are. Uh, there is also an audio component to these recordings. Um, and as we get close to a bat, you can hear on the computer, the audio recordings are obviously slowed down a little bit. Um, so you can hear them. But after a while, after you do enough of these transects, uh, you're able to identify some of the bats like red bats, I can pretty much tell when a red bat's coming along just by its by its echolocation. So anyway, so the night we did the recordings at Freedom Park, this is what we saw, okay? Um, what the program also does is, uh, and I'm gonna share another picture here, um, will give us a summary of the bats. And this is the summary of the bats that we found that night in Freedom Park. Basically, there are six species of bats in the coastal plain of Virginia in this area, and we found all six of these bats here um, in, in Freedom Park that night. So uh, some of these may have been double recorded because we were doing stationary recordings, but um, uh, we've picked up confirmed files for seven brown bats, one evening bat. Um, this is a free tail bat, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. Uh, seven files of hoary bats, 40 files of red bats. So you can see, you know, red bat is the most common species around, and, and the, uh, the monitoring certainly uh, showed that. One silver haired bat, and uh, six files of tricolored bats. So, let me go to this hoary bat and the free tail bat here for just a second. Um, we found a lot of the hoary bats down the, um, in the swamp area down by the bridge. And uh, hoary bats tend to uh, echolocate at a lower frequency that may actually be heard by the human ear. Most of these other bats, the frequency is so high, you can't hear it. Um, free tail bats, free tail bats, are not found in southeastern Virginia. So if we're picking up free tail bats, um, after I delved into this a little bit, I think what we're actually hearing are hoary bats. Okay, because uh, when I've posted some of this information before, uh, some of the bat experts have questioned uh, our findings of free tail bats. So I think because the echolotations between the free tail bat and the hoary bat are so close and, and they're lower frequencies, computer is confusing, um, confusing the echolocation. So I think though, what we're picking up here is uh, actually hoary bats. So, um, so this was our summary here. And um, based on that summary, uh, we went to four different locations um, in the park. Uh, the first location that we monitored was uh, at the settlement area and there was a bat house there. Um, I should point out one other thing that uh, the two bat houses that are existing in the park are actually were actually donated and quotes maintained. At least that's what the sign said on the bat boxes um, by Go8. So they are actually owned by Go8. And uh, if uh, there was any um, thing that needed to be done with the uh, bat houses, we'd actually uh, Freedom Park would have to coordinate with Go8. Uh, in terms of their relocation. 
Uh, the other thing is that uh, one of the uh, the reasons we looked at these houses was uh, the rangers basically said they were not being used. And uh, so moving, maybe moving them to a better location uh, might uh, improve their usage. Uh, nobody has gone up to into the bad houses to actually look at them, but there's like no guano on the ground. There's nothing that would indicate that the bad houses are being used. So up at the settlement, there is a bad, bad house. And when we did the monitoring there, we really didn't find any bats flying around at that time. It was just at dusk. Not all the bats are out at dusk. So, um, you know, maybe that was a uh, erroneous finding. Uh, we then moved down to the swamp area. There's a bridge down by the swamp area in Freedom Park. And um, we uh, set up our equipment down there and monitored some bats. And there, there are a fair number of bats, and mainly hoary bats, down in that area. So we figured that um, that may be a good location to put a bat house on solid ground. Uh, we then moved up to uh, another area um, as on the trail that goes into the um, uh, that goes into the um, swamp. Uh, there is a bat house in that open field down there, and um, we found a lot of bats again on the tree line as the uh, as you enter that swamp area, the trail to the swamp area. We figured that that might actually be a decent area to relocate a house. The, the current house is uh, maybe you know, 20, 30 feet away from the tree line. And uh, we're thinking that maybe if it's relocated closer to the tree line, we may get some uh, bats using that house. The third area we went to, and we, we did stop at the Williamsburg Botanical Garden, and uh, there were some bats flying around that area. Uh, the third location we went to was on the road going into Freedom Park. It crosses a, a little stream. It's, uh, there's a guardrail on the right-hand side, and uh, we monitored some, uh, some bats there, and we thought that would be an excellent location for the, uh, the third bat house. So basically what we came up with um, in terms of recommendations for the uh, uh, Freedom Park uh, bat houses was that we would take the one from the settlement and then relocate that one on solid ground um, uh, at the swamp area. Uh, take the uh, uh, bat house that was in the field and move it closer to the tree line, and then put up a new bat house uh, at the entrance down by the uh, on the road by the guardrails, and uh, see if we could uh, get some bats in there. So um, that's uh, pretty much what we came up with for. Uh, the bat population in Freedom Park. It looks like, it, you know, this is the middle of the summer when the bats are most active. Looks like we have a pretty healthy population of bats that are, that are flying around Freedom Park. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, you can put it on the chat line. I'd be happy to answer them. And um, we'll move on to Joni now, okay? I'll get off of this. Thank you, Bill. We've all missed um, monitoring our bats lately because we enjoy them so much and COVID has really affected everything. But a couple of things that I wanna to respond to, um, there was a question in there and, and Wendy actually um, mentioned it a little bit about what can we do to help in our own yards. I wanna highly recommend just like I do with my butterfly talks, if any of you have been to my butterfly talks, if you plant the host plant of moths, you're gonna actually get um, that moth in your yard. So for the Luna moth, which is a very large moth that would be very enticing to bats, they eat off of sweet gum trees. So just having sweet gums around your property is going to draw the luna moth there because that's where they're going to lay their eggs and, and go through their um, life cycle. Another one is like evening primroses. Uh, those are um, the type of uh, tersa moths or uh, some of our hawk moths like evening primroses. So if you look for the host plant of specific very large moths, um, the cecropia, which is the largest moth in North America, they eat wild cherry. So you can have very natural things in your yard and on your property um, that are gonna naturally draw 
uh, the larger moths or the silk moths into your world. And that's going to obviously in the food chain play a part into drawing um, uh, the bats to your property because that's what they want. You know, the, the thousands of mosquitoes are great. Um, but those large moths are probably payday for those um, for those bats, specifically in the early parts of spring, like April, when your first luna moths hatch. Um, that's probably a really big food um, source for them uh, coming right out of hibernation. So one fun thing that we also do um, in our pro our area, we live in the Surrey section, so my husband and I monitor the Hog Island sector which is 15 miles so if you're driving this sector and getting um, acoustic monitoring of the bats for 15 miles and you're doing it at 15 miles per hour it takes about two hours to do a, a reading to really get this data in a particular area surrey's been good because we don't have a lot of traffic over here and if we go in one particular uh full 15 mile sector a lot of a lot of it actually goes through chip oak state park so we have had a great um, opportunity to work with the state park on monitoring species for them that they can publicize. For a master naturalist, that's a great um, partnership to have is, is with a Virginia master naturalist and with a state park and to monitor things and to help to interpretive program for them. So uh, several miles of our sector is actually through Chip Oak State Park. So we've had a great partnership with them and we came up with after our first year of monitoring the data and getting excited about the data we started incorporating it into interpretive programs there so we actually have bat wagon nights throughout uh this the bat season we start in i'd say what um late march early april i don't think it's not it's not worth uh, monitoring the bats until the bugs come out so it's usually a, a certain temperature you can start on very those warm days that come up when everything's hatching and you might see your your first mosquitoes and stuff you can probably actually get a few readings of uh, some bats coming out and then we would monitor all the way until this colder weather in october so we would have bat wagons um, throughout the season at night and do some interpretive programs starting at dusk physically seeing the bats having the um, uh, the chief ranger talk about bats in the park and then follow up with a ride on a hay wagon that fits about 25 people with the equipment, the son of bat equipment, and letting everybody see as we hit these acoustic um, bat sounds, them come up on the screen and then we bring flashlights and uh, usually the children like to open up the guide bats to Virginia book, if you can see this. This is a Department of Inlands and Fishery production uh, from the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and they get to open it up and look at the particular bat that came up on the screen. So they see a picture of the bat and they can see some different things so they know exactly what type of bat they were seeing at the time. It has been sold out if I mean it's free but it's been fully filled every time that we do it. So this is a big draw for families and campers, but uh, they allow people who aren't campers to come and um, do the bat wagon as well. So it's just a good way to educate on bats and their importance. I think Wendy did a great job on her program uh, on talking about some of the myths. Those are also times that we can share about myths and also share about what are people doing with this data and white nose syndrome and getting that out there and just trying to educate the public on the different things. Um, that are available. So one of the other questions was, what was the best box, bat box that you could use um, for bats? And we have found, I think collectively as a Virginia Master Naturalist group from different things that we've been a part of or seminars that we've participated in, that for our area, the rocket bat box is something that is the best type of box to put up for the bats. If you are into building bat boxes or um, watching that. For Chip Oak State Park, just like Freedom Park, we've had uh, an Eagle Scout project uh, on that. So we're drawing in the public to do bat boxes, rocket bat, box, rocket bat boxes for the Chip Oak State Park. Those are in the building stage right now. So we look forward to putting those up. Um, we can send some instructions out with a video, I think, Judith, uh, on the rat, rocket bat box. 
um, so that you can have those available too, because that, that would be our recommendation, I believe, as Virginia Master Naturalists. Yeah, we can definitely send that info. So I'll take questions, or I think all of us would take questions if anybody had them. Well, okay, so I'll start at the top, because this will be some, make it somewhat Judith? sequential, Judith? yes. Okay. Judith, before you start, um, this is Wendy, there's a couple of things that I wanted to um, say. One thing that really could be fun if you have some extra money and you want to do this yourself, um, there is a little microphone that you actually can plug into your phone that does the same thing that um, our microphone does. It has software with it. Um, it's called the Echo, Echo Meter Touch 2. Um, so again, Echo Meter Touch 2. It's around $180. Um, so it's a fair chunk of change, but less expensive than um, our equipment. Our equipment gives us a lot more capabilities. We can do the driving transects with that. Um, but if you want to go out and just um, when you're at the park or in your backyard, have your phone with a microphone on it, um, look up the Echo Meter Touch 2. It's, it's, it's a fun thing. It's also not as accurate as what we're using, um, but allows people just to start really getting familiar with the bats in their area. Um, and it's an exciting thing to do. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, um, I think I've already just lost, so I'll have to come back to that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes. One other thing that I wanted to mention was the, um, again, the Ologies podcast. Um, it's chi chiroptera, chiropterology. Um, but anyway, Merlin Tuttle, M-E-R-L-I-N Tuttle, T-U-T-T-L-E, is the bat expert that they were talking to that I said had been working with bats for over five decades. He has a site um, that's called MerlinTuttle.org, and it talks about selecting a bat house. It talks about white-nose syndrome, and again, um, you know, there, there's Bats are in a lot of danger right now because it has come out that they think that COVID started with a bat. And so people are getting really, really, really afraid. Um, that was a freaky, strange thing that, again, that's extremely rare. Um, and so right now is a particularly important time to talk about how important bats are to our ecosystem for our crops or just so many different things for pest control. Um, so getting the word out, especially now, um, is, is an important thing. Okay, thanks. You can go back to the question. Thank you, Wendy. And um, I see Joni's been um, typing in some answers, but I'm going to start at the top. Okay, I had a question. So we were talking about bats and why they hang upside down, which I found fascinating. But when they rest, when they're actually active and they're flying around and eating, but then they need to rest, do they hang upside down then too? Yes, they do. Okay. Now, I, it could be times where they don't, but I mean, that's what they're used to because when you think about it, if they didn't hang upside down, how are they going to take off? Okay, super duper. Um, okay, so Karen said, fascinating, and whatever it was, she got to see that during a visit to Austin, neat. Um, when we were looking at the uh, cute bat up, I typed in that cuteness score just went up for me. <laughs> Karen asked, is there a way to control the fungus, the white nose syndrome? They've tried a number of different things. They have not found... Um, good ways of doing it. There may have been new things that have come up maybe in the last year that I'm not up with, but they were trying vaccines, they were trying different things, and um, the last I heard, the best way of controlling the fungus is to just, um, you know, if you, if you are an, a person who really likes caving, decontaminate everything before you go in and after you come out, and um, but otherwise, they haven't really found good methods right now. Mm, okay. Laura asked, is there, well, I think this actually did get covered, but here's her question. Is there a way to track them, attract them to your property? We live on eight acres, and I'd love the pest assistance. Um, 
and the best type of bat house question came up again. But I, th I think that Wendy and <clears throat> Joni um, ha have covered that information. Well, um, I do want to say, if you're not watching the chat, that milkweed, uh, you know, I'm such a fan of milkweed, too, if you've ever gee, listened why? to my Why is that? <laughs> uh, the milkweed blooms, especially on the common milkweed, the really tall one that has the big, showy, globe, pink blooms. And if you've ever been in a field of milkweed in the summer, it knocks you out more than lilacs, like a field of lilacs would. That's how strong the evening bloom is on, or how much it smells throughout the evening um, in your yard, or uh, this is the uh, Escapolis uh, syriaca, the common milkweed. That thing, if you watch at dusk and watch those beautiful sphinx moss come out, or um, and just watch them dance in those milkweed blooms, like you're almost intoxicated with them. So I can imagine if you have that in your yard, not only for the monarchs, you wanna have that in your yard for uh, the moss that you're drawing and you know, ultimately the bats. Bats eat bugs, they eat, uh, you know, why would they eat tiny mosquitoes when they can eat these big um, sachems or uh, big, big silk moss? things like that. So if you're drawing the lepidopteral world to your yard or any pollinator, that's what the bat is going to be going for, is those bigger bugs. I didn't know that about common milkweed. Well, and Joni also, <laughs> yeah. and Joni also mentioned, you know, one of the moss liking the sweet gums, which also brings me back to what one of the slides that I had said was, um, you know, your trees and your bushes, go native. You know, the Bartlett pears that we have in our, in our yard isn't helping any of the bugs or the birds. Um, and so, you know, just stick with the native plants. That's what the native insects are gonna go for and what the native bats are going to go for. And it's just really important for almost anything. You know, you'll, you'll hear the same with, with like um, Joni said, with the bugs and the butterflies, it will same with the birds. Um, you know, just keep it as natural and native as you possibly can. Super, thank you. Um, I was wondering, and perhaps I missed it when I was working some of the controls. How fast can bats fly? There are bats that well. I was going to say 40 miles an hour, but I you'd think they can swoop really, really fast to, for going after the insects, uh, but they're not going to be flying that fast um, as they're just flying around. Um, but they, they are very fast, and I think it is between 30 to 40 miles an hour. And the reason that I hesitated was because also the smaller bats um, can live up to 40 years is one thing that I hadn't mentioned. Bats usually only have one pup um, a year. And that's why um, like things like white nose syndrome can be so devastating because they don't have a large population because they are long lit lived. And so um, 30 to 40 years for the smaller bat, which is kind of the opposite of things, you know, like large or that a lot of times smaller doesn't last as long. Um, you know, with birds or bugs or things like that. Um, but they can have a long lifetime, 30 to 40 years. You just blew me away with that information. I had no idea. Um, next question. I'm in central, lower central Virginia between Lynchburg and Danville. What bats am I looking to support in that area? Is there a site that has info for what plants, therefore, which bugs will be good for them? So I'm not as familiar with the area, but it sounds like you might be closer to the mountain. Um, so, you know, here in Southeast, we were having the red, the hoary, the tricolor, the big brown bat. Um, you'll probably have the same as those, uh, but you also may be getting some of the bats that are more the Western type that like the caves. Um, the, just going through and um, searching on there, there were some really nice bat sites out there. I think um, it was the National Wildlife Service. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Um, but you can, there's, there's 
one of the services, um, whether it's forestry or wildlife, will have a map that just kind of shows what kind of bats you can find in the area. So I just to start your search with bats in Virginia. Um, and that will give you more of a, a little more of a clue. As far as I know, and like I said, I'm not a bat expert, as far as I know, they all eat the same types of things. So, so whatever you're going to be doing um, in your yard will, will work for any of the bats. We do not have the fruit bats here in, in Virginia. That's more, um, you know, down in Alabama, Florida, Mexico, that type of thing. Thank you. Next question. Why would you cite a bat house near the tree line? Isn't an open area better? Because don't do trees get in the way of the acoustics of their echolocation? You, the, the trees will get in the way of echolocation, but think about the bats. The bats that are going to be roosting in a house are more, again, you know, the bats that would roost in a tree or um, in an actual house type of thing. So um, it's a good question. We, when we're, when we're driving, we try and stay away from really tightly wooded areas, they say. However, part of my transect went through really, really tight woods. It was just one way to get to the next space where the open space, and I would see bat calls in there as well. So I'm not sure that I'm answering your question right, but um, the thing is, is that if you're going through and you're trying to attract a bat to roost somewhere, you'd want to put it near a place that they'd be comfortable roosting. Let me just add that I, I don't, if you put it in an open area, at least for a bat house, they may feel that they're more exposed. And uh, when we did the monitoring in Freedom Park, we picked up most of our bats around water and around the tree line. Uh, that's why, again, our recommendation was informal that uh, they move the houses closer to the tree lines or closer to water. I agree with um, Bill and Wendy on those points too. When we're doing this sector, uh, our sectors, I would have thought you would have tons of bats over wheat fields or corn fields or things like that. You never find them. You're never really getting the acoustic bat monitoring in the open field. And I think Bill's probably hit it. We're not experts, but we feel like they're probably more vulnerable if they're out in that particular setting. They like the water. They like the trees. And, um, you know, they're finding their crags. They, they live in the crags. So anywhere that you can be where it mimics more like a crag in a tree, um, that's where they're going, at least in our area. Now, if you're in more of the western part of the state or more in the mountains, you want to mimic somewhere where it's more like a cave um, for them. So think about their habitat, learn about the habitat of the particular bat in your area, and then try to simulate where they might use your uh, sp specific house. And I also want to mention about the bat houses. I think there has to be some sort of maintenance with them. You know, you want to make sure they're cleaned out and not having any kind of white nose syndrome and things like that. That's not a lot that I know about, but um, as I'm working with the Eagle Scout project in Chip Oaks, I'm learning more about um, continuing maintenance or how to keep it active, not just putting it up and leaving it behind. So there's a stewardship part to bat houses as well. There's another thing, too, that you want to be sure that when you're putting up a bat house, that you're putting it in the right place, you're getting the right time. Um, like I said, go to MerlinTuttle.org, and he has the qualities, the characteristics of a quality bat house. Oops, I'm getting a lot of feedback again. Is there a it's, mute problem? It's, I, think it's just, just, I, think, I think it's just you, Wendy. We're here. Okay, good. Fine. Perfect. Okay. Can, I add, can um, I add to that for just a second? I've got at the bottom of the chat box, um, there's a site called batmanagement.com that will give you more information as to uh, bat houses. Cool. And um, just to, to reinforce what Joni said, uh, when I do the, uh, I, I do the Yorktown transect, which actually goes through the battlefield of Yorktown, I rarely pick up bats in that open area. Most of the bats are found near the water or closer to the tree lines. 
Okay. Uh, moving forward, um, Joni, uh, uh, who's speaking? Uh, Wendy's speaking. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. Um, another thing about bat houses too is is that um, you need to have the right type for the right place. Temperature is a really important thing in the bat house, um, and you know maybe Bill can talk to you a little bit more, but you know, that you actually will paint it different color during, you know, whether gray or black, depending on where it is to again, to try to control the temperature. Um, you also want like interior surfaces and stuff and landing areas to be roughened to help the bats, especially the young ones, be able to get a secure footing on it. Um, so it's one of those things that if you want to do a bat house, um, it's a good idea to do the research of the right way of doing things. Same with, you know, like the Osprey platforms. I didn't know that there was a right and a wrong way with the Osprey platforms. Um, but it was amazing to find out, you know, all the things that, oh, yeah, no, having, um, <clears throat> having it be able to drain, having kind of, kind of mesh at the bottom and stuff so you don't end up drowning the birds. You know, it's, it's, it's important to, if you're trying to help um, to get some sort of a habitat for an animal, make sure you do some really good research to make sure you're doing it right. Okay. Um, Can I just add to that on the bad houses? Just in a nutshell, bad houses need to be between 10 and 13 feet high, placed between, between 10 and 13 feet high. They need a, a south, southeast orientation, at least a orientation on the 140 degree line. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, that, as Wendy mentioned, they like warm. They like to be warm. So the sun has to be shining on that bat house for you know, a good portion of the day. <clears throat> and they also don't like any daylight in the daylight. So bat houses have to be constructed fairly tight in terms of no leakage of light into the house uh, in the daylight hours. Very interesting. And I had asked the question, how do we find out dates for Bat Wagon? And it will be advertised on the Chip Oaks website, hopefully back in 2021, if all goes well with COVID. Okay, so Laura, I think we answered your question on the best place and direction to hang a bat. I uh, thought occurred to me, how many bats will use one bat house? Does anyone know? They have larger bat houses that can host more of a colony, um, but I, otherwise I really don't know the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Riley asked, what do bats eat? And the answer to that is flying insects. That much I have learned. And Joni uh, commented, milkweed blooms are a great draw for evening moths. Uh, bat management, Bill, typed in the uh, batmanagement.com for information, and we'll, I'll include that link in our follow-up. Kathy asked, I have a pond with a trellis and clematis over it, very narrow, but cuts across it. Would the trellis interfere with the bats going to the pond, or are they able to detect it? It's not okay. going to detect it. You're going to have a great setup that way. Very good job. So the yeah, answer that's, that's one of the things that's um, also helpful for attracting bats is to have a water source. Um, yeah. Fountains are really nice because then you're not as likely to get um, mosquitoes breeding in there because you really don't, still water is not that great. They, they're not that interested in the mosquitoes to begin with and they'll just bother you. Um, so moving water is, is the ultimate, but otherwise, um, you know, just having water source for them will make them more interested in your area. Could I mention some of your, um, uh, some seeds you can plant that, plant that like to climb, moonflower. You can buy a 50 cent pack of seeds at Dollar General and I love to plant those and let them climb up a, a, a planter pole or something. Those white blooms are huge attractors to evening moths and um, also Datura, which is a you know, that's your Jimson weed or your native to this area, but that's kind of a little bit of a toxic plant. But those evening, um, the Datura that open up in the 
evening or your four o'clocks that open up in the afternoons, those are all draws to the evening, um, uh, the evening in flying insects. Uh, Kathy in Seattle, and Kathy, you were on our session last week. Hello, welcome back. Um, one of the maps showed, this is what she wrote. We are in Seattle, Washington area. One of the maps you showed, we don't have as many types quantity as back east. What, determ what determines the range of bats? Uh, well, the map that I was showing was, um, if, if we're talking about the same thing, was where you had um, the white nose syndrome. And um, ah. so Washington, since it started out in the east, everybody thinks that it was spreading from the east or even actually from um, Europe, which I'm not quite sure how it would have gotten here from there, but some people have, have wondered that. Um, and so um, Washington has its bats. It just um, was in the last couple of years that those bats started um, getting the white nose syndrome. Um, all right. But yeah. but that uh, is a good question. Add, I, what uh, what does determine the range of a bat of a particular bat? I mean, it's the type of bat because some bats will act, some bats hibernate or not hibernate. Some bats will migrate. So there are bats that will migrate from Florida up to Virginia, and some bats are just year round and will just hibernate um, in the state. So it depends on the type of bat for the range. But it sounded like Bill had another thought. Well, um, I, the white nose syndrome occurs mainly in cave dwelling bats, and so um, I think that's you know that's the issue there. We don't have cave dwelling bats in our area. Up in Washington State, you may have caves that the bats are in that you know it's affecting you know you, that's why it's spreading up there. Um, as to where it came from, I did read an article that it was introduced from Europe, I think from Belgium. Two spelunkers or went into um, a cave, uh, I'm not sure where, somewhere in the Northeast, that had uh, the uh, white nose or the fungus that causes white nose syndrome on their equipment. And that's how it got to the US. Wow. And it has spread since from there. Uh, Joni typed in Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, a guide to the bats of Virginia is the best guide for finding bats in your area. So Kathy in Seattle, there must be something from your um, state game and fisheries. Uh, Chris had asked, uh, it, will the bats be attracted to salt water or just fresh water? It's a really good question that I have no answer to, but my best guess would be that it would be fresh water. Um, I would think that uh, since they're mammals that are, um, you know, our, our bats would have access to brackish water, um, but the bats out, for instance, out west wouldn't have any adaptations to be able to handle salt water would be my guess. I, I would be surprised if they did salt water or brackish water, just like humans really wouldn't be able to survive that well with it or at all with it. Yeah, that makes actually makes sense. <clears throat> I had asked, uh, what are their predators? And the answer from Joni is owls, which makes sense because they are night hunters. Owls, but you know, actually, um, owls and people, people are, like I said, the biggest, one of the biggest things trying to get rid of them because they're afraid of them or think they're a pest. Um, so, but otherwise, they don't have a lot of natural predators. Interesting, interesting. Uh, okay, let's see. The, and those, um, those wind turbines have been a predator for, or a problem for the um, bats because of the um, acoustic stuff too. So the the wind turbines are are starting mm. to be a big problem for the bats. Just yep. as a side note, takes a toll. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and Tonya uh, comments that the the folks at Wild Birds Unlimited seem to know quite a bit about bat house maintenance, which is helpful. Um, we know la 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 la. 
Okay, we have the website for MerlinTuttle.com or .org. We'll, we'll check it out. I think, it's dot, I think it's .org, but I think I typed in .com and it brought me to .org. So. And most websites will do that. They will claim both so that, you know, it, they get found. They get found. So j just, uh, we are at the end of our questions and I just want to say thank you. This has been fascinating. So I'm going to stop the recording and end the program. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I am glad that we were able to fascinate you and hopefully we were able to fascinate more people. Because um, that's the biggest thing right now is bats, like I said, especially with COVID being blamed on bats. People get afraid of things and then they just want to get rid of them. And it would just be such a horrible thing for the environment if we didn't have bats. We're having all kinds of wonderful thank yous and great presentations. Learned a lot. This was so interesting. Thank you to all the presenters. And for now, have a great day. See you soon.